Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the history of SS Eastland, a Navy training vessel and the speed queen of the Great Lakes. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, wartime violence, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. This is our first ship that didn't sink, so it will be an interesting one. Shout out to the Ship Illustrator here on YouTube for the suggestion. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, Shipwreckers! Welcome to our first episode of the New Year. We have so many exciting plans with our ever-changing and growing channel this year, and we hope you stick with us to check it out. Thank you all so much for your suggestions and continued support. And with that, let's get into the history of SS Eastland. Our story begins in October of 1902, when the Michigan Steamship Company ordered a new passenger ship and cargo carrier for fruit and other cargo for the South Haven, Michigan to Chicago, Illinois route. The ship was built by the Jenks Shipbuilding Company in Port Huron, Michigan, though it is unknown the exact date of when her keel was laid. She'd be named SS Eastland in May of 1903, shortly before her launching. The ship was launched on May 6, 1903, being christened by Frances Elizabeth Stufflebeam, otherwise known as Mrs. John Peru, with a symbolic bottle of champagne in front of an eager crowd of 6,000. She'd slip into a slide launch in the Black River, being fitted for engines and boilers before setting off for her maiden voyage a few months later. As for the specifications of SS Eastland, she weighed 1,961 gross tons, displacing an estimated 2,600 registered tons. She was 265 feet in length, had a beam of 38 feet and 2 inches wide, and a draft of 19 feet and 6 inches tall. Her boilers and engines that she was fitted with were four coal-fired Scotch Marine boilers that powered two triple expansion steam engines, turning two propeller shafts. She averaged 16.5 knots, which was very fast for her time on the Great Lakes. The ship was fitted with two masts and two funnels, being painted white on her hull with a red keel and her smokestacks painted yellow with black tips. I've seen multiple incarnations of her color scheme immortalized in painting, so it is possible the smokestacks were either white with black tips, solid black, or solid yellow as well, so please keep that in mind. SS Eastland was able to transport 2,752 passengers and crew comfortably, though this number should be taken with a grain of salt. Her licensed capacity had been downgraded many times, from 3,300 to 2,800, then to 2,400, and even as low as 1,125 by the steamboat inspectors, though they were finally persuaded to up her passenger number to allow her to carry at least 2,500 passengers. We'll go over her Navy complement and armaments later when she's used by the U.S. Navy, but for now, these are her specs. After being finished, she set out for her maiden voyage on July 16, 1903, captained by Captain John Peru, the husband of the woman who christened the ship. The ship first traveled to Mackinac and then off to South Haven. On July 27, 1903, during her first season, she struck a laid-up tugboat, the George W. Gardner, and sank the tug at her dock at the Lake Street Bridge in Chicago, Illinois. SS Eastland only received minor damage and would be repaired to continue her career, but this was an ominous beginning to her career. After this, we come to a strange part. This is something I've never run into on Shipwreck Sunday, and frankly, I don't think we ever will again. It started a month after the maiden voyage, with Captain Peru facing one of his first challenges on August 13, 1903. SS Eastland embarked 550 passengers in Chicago, leaving with her passengers for South Haven. About two hours away from South Haven at noon that day, the Eastland reached the middle of Lake Michigan. Down in the boiler room, seven of the ship's firemen, all natives of Chicago, banked the fires under the boiler, letting the steam run down to about 80 pounds. These firemen left the fire hole, walking right up to Captain Peru to confront him about a problem they had. You see, they'd been promised mashed potatoes and hadn't received their promised spuddy goodness. And so, they refused to continue firing the boilers until they received their mashed potatoes. 
The group went to speak to the cook, and he explained, saying that the first crew at dinner had eaten all of the mashed potatoes in that serving, but that he was making more and they would be ready in a few minutes. It didn't take long to make a good plate of mashed potatoes. He offered the crew plain boiled potatoes in the meantime until the mashed ones were finished, and he never said to them that they wouldn't also receive their promised mashed spuds. Captain Peru tried to convince the men to go back to work until their potatoes were done, but they refused fervently. The two ringleaders of this strike, Glenn Watson and William Madden, continued to argue, with the argument getting more and more heated. Eventually, they had to be subdued and put in handcuffs alongside their other compatriots and taken below deck as prisoners, with Captain Peru putting a Chicago policeman who happened to be on board in charge of guarding the seven mutineers. However, because of a lack of steam, SS Eastland was dead in the water in the middle of Lake Michigan, which, as we know from last week, is not necessarily a desirable place to be. And passengers became alarmed, heading to the lower decks to see what the matter was. Someone had to get the boilers going, but who would it be? Well, volunteers from the passengers, dining room waiters, and ship's officers all put the working clothes on for the boiler room and headed down in shifts, firing the boilers and building up to 200 pounds of steam, getting the Eastland moving again. SS Eastland was only an hour later into South Haven than usual, with the seven firemen being arrested and taken to the police station, awaiting the arrival of United States Marshal Odin of Grand Rapids. At the station, the men were asked their names, and they were... William Madden, Glenn Watson, Mike Davern, Frank LaPlart, Ben Myers, Mike Smith, and Ed Fleming. The story only gets more interesting from here, dear listeners. The Marine Firemen's Union supported the firemen's claims that the food they were served was mostly leftovers from other tables and unfit to be eaten. The Union actually declared they were planning a strike on the Eastland so that no firemen would work aboard the steamer. However, the general manager of the Michigan Steamship Company, Mr. Layton, disagreed and said that the company was pushing forward to prosecute. The men were scheduled to be examined by the United States Marshal in front of the Circuit Court Commissioner. Investigators into what would become known as the Mashed Potato Mutiny actually found that five of the imprisoned firemen had been relieved of their watch before the strike and weren't involved. So two days later, after the examination by the circuit court commissioner, these five men were released. Ed Fleming and Glenn Watson remained in custody. There was a conference between the union delegate McKiffin from Chicago and the attorney for the boat company. And after this, papers charging the two with mutiny were drawn up, awaiting the marshal to serve them. Before we all go shaking our heads at how ridiculous this whole thing was, let's look at some evidence that gives the firemen more of a fair shake on this whole ordeal. The working conditions, especially on older steamers that had been built 15 to 20 years prior, were very poor for firemen. The Duluth Herald sent a reporter to interview firemen while this mutiny was the talk of town, with a fireman commenting on the working conditions of the average fireman for an edition of the Duluth Herald dated August 19, 1903. This fireman wasn't the least bit surprised that there had been a mutiny on the Eastland because the working conditions were hellish. He was quoted as saying, quote, Coming up from the hold, weak and faint from their hard labors in the stifling fire room, the cook is frequently the first person they run afoul of, and he generally gets the benefit of their ill humor. Meaning, they are hot, overworked, and hungry, and take out that anger on the cook. This fireman went on to say that firemen usually only mutinied because of harsh conditions, even if the small, almost trivial thing that starts a mutiny seems silly, like mashed potatoes. Don't get me wrong though, their conditions were indeed hellish, so let me set the scene for you. You're a fireman on a steamship similar to the Eastland, built at least 15 to 20 years prior to your start date. The owners of older vessels, like this imagined one you are working in, added two or three feet to the decks to increase carrying capacity. But they didn't add more boilers for any extra power, and they would pressure the captain to make the same time. So your captain is going to push you and the other firemen to work harder and longer hours. Not only this, but you're in the sweltering heat that rose to at least 150 degrees Fahrenheit without any fresh air, because the ventilators were about 40 or so feet above your head. It's hot, humid, and you're being pushed to the brink. Newer freighters and more modern boats had less issues, since the conditions were better and it was far easier to steam these ships. But for ships like the Eastland, the conditions were brutal. If you didn't get your plate of nice, buttery mashed potatoes after working long hours in conditions like this, you'd probably mutiny too. I know I would. 
The mutiny charges against the two firemen would be dropped by the Eastland's owners on August 20th, 1903, at a hearing in Benton Harbor, Michigan. The Watson and Fleming were still bound over to the United States District Court at a hearing before the United States Commissioner Harvey, with the government officers pushing forward with the case despite the ship's officers and the officers of the firemen's union agreeing not to press charges. At the end of the hearing, Watson and Fleming were escorted to jail in Grand Rapids by Deputy United States Attorney Covell. According to an article written by the Duluth Herald, Captain Peru and mate Charles Richardson were in Chicago all day on August 20th, 1903, aboard the Eastland that was dry docked there for maintenance. Peru is quoted as saying, quote, Although I made the mutiny charges, General Manager Layton has been acting for the company in adjusting the matter. He gave me to understand that Watson and Fleming were not to be prosecuted by officers of the company. Therefore, I did not go up to the hearing at Benton Harbor today. Shortly after this, Captain Peru would be replaced. And this, my friends, concludes the mashed potato mutiny. After the mutiny, the ship was found to not be hitting her targeted 19 knots during the first season. She had a draft too deep for the Black River in South Haven, where she was being loaded. So the ship will return to Port Huron in September of 1903 for modifications. Of the multiple modifications made, two notable ones were machinery adjustments to reduce draft and an air conditioning system being added. These modifications would increase the ship's speed, but they would also increase the weight and reduce her draft, which would cause its own problem. It reduced what is called the metrocentric height, which is the measurement of the initial static stability of a floating body, and so she was far less stable than her original design. This brings us to the early, smaller accidents the ship would suffer as a result. In May of 1904, she would return to South Haven, with the ship having won a race against a ship called the City of South Haven on the way to Chicago, which is the beginning of her nickname as the Speed Queen of the Great Lakes. Around this time, SS Eastland was experiencing problems with her stability, especially while loading and unloading her cargo and passengers. On July 17, 1904, she left South Haven with about 3,000 passengers, and she nearly capsized. Subsequently, they reduced her capacity to 2,800 passengers maximum, and they dry docked her to remove cabins, repair the hull, and add extra lifeboats. She had another incident of severe listing on August 5, 1906, and this resulted in complaints being levied against the ship's operator, the Chicago South Haven Line, and whose owners, the Michigan Transportation Company, had purchased the ship sometime a little earlier in the year. Shortly after, the ship would be sold again to the Lakeshore Navigation Company of Cleveland, Ohio. After being sold shortly before the 1907 season began, the ship was moved to Lake Erie, running the Cleveland to Cedar Point route. The ship was sold again in 1909 to the Eastland Navigation Company, continuing to run the Cleveland to Cedar Point route. After this 1909 season, 39 more cabins were removed, and later in 1911, the top smokestack sections were removed to shorten her stack height. She had yet another incident of severe listing on July 1, 1912, listing to around 25 degrees while loading passengers in Cleveland. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't feel comfortable getting on a ship with that severe of a listing problem. In June of 1914, SS Eastland was yet again sold, this time to the St. Joseph Chicago Steamship Company, returning to Lake Michigan to run the St. Joseph Michigan to Chicago route. She would receive a new captain, Captain Harry Peterson, and her old hardwood flooring in the forward dining room on the cabin level was replaced with two inches of concrete. They also added concrete near the aft gangway. The rest of 1914 went by without incident for the SS Eastland, but 1915 would be disastrous. Before we really get into it, I do have to set the scene again. After Titanic sank in 1912, things changed a lot in the shipping world. There had been horrific disasters before, but not quite one that had garnered so much attention like this. So, as a result, during 1915, the new Federal Seamen's Act had been passed. The Seamen's Act was designed to improve the safety and security of United States seamen and eliminate shanghaiing, which is forcing someone to join a ship lacking a full crew by drugging them or using other underhanded means. This law passing meant many ships had to add and update lifeboats, and Eastland was no different. She had a complete set of lifeboats retrofitted, and although this was a good thing, it did add more weight to the already unsteady ship that was already incredibly top-heavy. Some even argued that other Great Lakes ships would suffer the same issue, also being unstable due to the added weight of more lifeboats. 
President Woodrow Wilson would sign it into law, and Eastland could either reduce capacity or add more lifeboats, and so leadership elected to add more lifeboats. They had to get more lifeboats in order to qualify for a license to increase the capacity to 2,570 passengers. Eastland was already dangerously top-heavy, so much so she had special restrictions on how many passengers could be aboard her. Due to the added concrete we discussed earlier, the ship had an extra 15 to 20 tons of weight she was also carrying around. So you can probably see where this is going. On July 24, 1915, five Great Lakes passenger steamers, the Petoskey, Racine, Theodore Roosevelt, Rochester, and SS Eastland, were chartered by Western Electric Company's Hawthorne Works to take employees from Cicero, Illinois to Michigan City, Indiana for a picnic. This was extremely exciting and an important event to the workers. Many of them were either unable to or could not afford to take holidays, so this was their holiday. In the morning, passengers embarked Eastland on the south bank of the Chicago River between Clark and LaSalle streets around 6.30 a.m. With the ship reaching her capacity of 2,572 passengers by 7.10 a.m., people were stuffed onto the Eastland like sardines in a can, and so they went to the deck to get fresh air. This made the top-heavy ship even more unstable, and she began to list to the port side, leaning away from the wharf. The crew noticed and tried to stabilize the ship by flooding water into her ballast tanks, but this did little to nothing. At 7.28 a.m., disaster struck. Eastland lurched sharply to port, rolling completely onto her port side and resting on the river bottom. It was only 20 feet deep, so barely half the vessel was submerged. It looked similar to the Costa Concordia disaster, which we will be covering here later this month. Other than the passengers on deck who were feeling stuffy, the majority had gone below deck since it was a damp, cool morning in order to warm themselves and settle in. Consequently, hundreds of people were suddenly trapped when the ship rolled, water keeping them where they were, and others were crushed by heavy furniture like pianos, bookcases, and tables. Others drowned or were killed on impact. Despite the ship resting in only 20 feet of water and the quick response time of the nearby vessel Kenosha, which came alongside the Eastland to help those stranded on the capsized steamer to jump to safety, 844 passengers and four crewmen were killed in the sudden capsizing. Many of the passengers that day aboard Eastland happened to be immigrants, with many of them being from what is presently the Czech Republic, back then it was Czechoslovakia, as well as Poland, Germany, Sweden, Italy, Norway, Ireland, Hungary, Denmark, and Austria. Many of the Czech immigrants had settled in Cicero, Illinois, where Eastland set out from, and of the 844 passengers that perished, 220 of them were Czech. After the disaster, the bodies of the victims were removed and taken to various temporary morgues for identification. By that afternoon, the remaining bodies that could not be identified were consolidated in the armory of the 2nd Regiment. In the wake of the disaster, Western Electric Company, who employed many of the victims, would give $100,000 to recovery and relief efforts of family members of the victims. American football plays a minute role in this story. One of the people scheduled to be aboard the Eastland was 20-year-old George Hallis, an American football player, though he was delayed leaving for the dock, and by the time he reached the ship, she'd already capsized. The newspapers listed him as deceased, but when fraternity brothers visited his house to give their condolences, they found him very much alive. Hallis would go on to become coach and owner of the Chicago Bears, as well as a founding member of the National Football League. His friend and future Bears executive, Ralph Brizolara, and his brother were aboard the Eastland when she capsized, though they managed to escape through the portholes and survived unscathed. There are reports that Jack Benny came aboard the Eastland, but there's no evidence supporting this claim. This rumor came about because Eastland would later become a training vessel during World War I, and Benny received his training in the Great Lakes Naval Base where Eastland resided. There was film footage taken of the recovery efforts of Eastland, but it wasn't discovered or released until early 2015, when a graduate student at the University of Illinois at Chicago found it. The last known survivor of the capsizing, Marion Eckholz, died on November 24, 2014, at the age of 102. This would make her around two or three, depending upon when her birthday was, when the ship capsized. As for the immediate aftermath, a writer named Jack Woodford, known for writing Trial and Error, witnessed the disaster firsthand and gave his account to the Herald and Examiner, a Chicago newspaper. In his autobiography, Woodford would go on to write, quote, And then movement caught my eye. I looked across the river. 
as I watched in disoriented stupefaction a steamer larger as an ocean liner slowly turned over on its side as though it were a whale going to take a nap. I didn't believe a huge steamer had done this before my eyes, lashed to a dock in perfectly calm water, in excellent weather, with no explosion, no fire, nothing. I thought I had gone crazy. Newspapers and books would buzz at the time, wanting to get the news out there, and they are a huge part of the reason why we do have the information we do, and why it has remained so largely in the public's eye. We aren't going to cover every publication and what they have said about Eastland, and even modern-day retellings of the story exist in articles, essays, musicals, and more. Hell, even Disney Channel got in on it at some point. Maybe one day we'll revisit this and go over more of the media's involvement, but for now, we are going to leave it at that. As for the inquiry, a grand jury ended up indicting the president and three officers of the steamship company for manslaughter, as well as Captain Peterson and the ship's engineer for criminal carelessness. They found the reason for the disaster to be what we all know it to be, quote, conditions of instability caused by any or all of the overloading of passengers, the construction of the ship, or the mishandling of the water ballast. There were federal extradition hearings held to compel the six indicted men to come from Michigan to Illinois to be tried. During the hearings, the president of the shipbuilding company that built the Eastland, Sidney Jenks, was a principal witness and he testified that her first owners wanted a fast ship to transport fruit. And so with this in mind, he designed the Eastland to be able to carry fruit and 500 passengers at 17 knots. Defense attorney Clarence Darrow asked Jenks whether he had ever worried about Eastland being converted into a passenger ship carrying 2,500 or more passengers. Jenks responded, quote, I had no way of knowing the quantity of its business after it left our yards. No, I did not worry about the Eastland. Jenks testified that they never performed a stability test and that after the ship tilted to 45 degrees at launch, testifying that, quote, it righted itself as straight as a church, satisfactorily demonstrating its stability. Due to a lack of evidence, the court refused extradition, stating there was, quote, barely a scintilla of proof to establish probable cause to find the six men guilty. The court concluded that the four company officers weren't actually aboard the ship and that every act being levied against the captain and engineer was done in the regular course of business, which, quote, was more consistent with innocence than with guilt. The court also found that Eastland, quote, was operated for years and carried thousands safely, and that because of this, it was impossible to find the six accused guilty or unjustified in their belief of the ship's seaworthiness. This isn't the end of SS Eastland's story, however. She was raised from the water on August 14, 1915, and then she was sold to the Illinois Naval Reserve, being recommissioned as USS Wilmette, which is what we will call her from now on. As USS Wilmot, she was stationed at Great Lakes Naval Base near North Chicago in Lake County, Illinois. She'd be converted into a gunboat, officially renamed USS Wilmot on February 20th, 1918, and commissioned on September 20th, 1918, with Captain William B. Wells mastering her. She was commissioned late in World War I, and so the ship did not see any combat. Instead, she was a training vessel that would train sailors, and she'd be regular upkept and repaired until placed in ordinary at Chicago on July 9, 1919. Being placed in ordinary, or placed on the reserve fleet, means that USS Wilmot was a fully armed naval vessel, but was unneeded. These ships were sometimes said to be, quote, in mothballs, or, quote, mothballed, as if stuffed in the closet for safekeeping. While mothballed, USS Wilmot retained a 10-man crew solely for taking care of her. On June 29, 1920, she'd returned to full commission. On June 7, 1921, she was given her biggest task yet. Wilmot was to sink UC-97, a German U-boat surrendered to the United States after World War I. Her guns were manned by gunner's mate J.O. Sabin, who fired the first American cannon of World War I, and gunner's mate A.F. Anderson, the man who fired the first torpedo of World War I. For the remainder of her 25-year career, she would serve as a training ship for naval reservists of the 9th, 10th, and 11th Naval Districts. USS Wilmot would make voyages along the shores of the Great Lakes, taking her young trainees assigned from Naval Station Great Lakes with her, Ernie Pyle, the famed World War II correspondent, actually trained for three weeks aboard the USS Wilmot, according to him. She remained in commission up until February 15, 1940, when she was placed, quote, out of commission in service.
A year later, on February 17, 1941, she would be given the whole designation IX-29, and on March 30, 1942, she'd go to Chicago to resume training sailors. Here, she was mostly preparing armed guard crews for duty manning the guns on armed merchant cruisers. She continued training such crews until World War II ended in the European theater, when armed merchant cruisers patrolling the ocean to protect transatlantic shipping was no longer needed. During August of 1943, USS Willamette transported President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Admiral William D. Leahy, Harry Hopkins, and James F. Burns during a 10-day cruise to McGregor and Whitefish Bay on Lake Superior so the men could plan war strategies in peace. On April 9, 1945, she was once again returned to full commission for a short period of time, only to be decommissioned on November 28th of that year, with her name being removed from the Navy list on December 19th of 1945. She was up for sale as of 1946, but sadly there were no takers. And by October 31st, 1946, she was sold to the Hyman Michaels Company for scrapping, and her scrapping was complete by the end of 1947. There were memorials set up in remembrance of the victims and the accident of the Eastland. A marker remembering the accident was dedicated on June 4, 1989, though it was sadly stolen on April 26, 2000, finally being replaced on July 24, 2003. On Sunday, July 12, 2015, 100 years after the Eastland disaster occurred, a memorial for the dead was finally dedicated at Bohemian National Cemetery, which is located at 5255 North Pulaski Road in Chicago, Illinois, United States, 60630 for anyone who would like to visit. There are plans for another exhibit, one that would be a permanent outdoor exhibit with six displays, each that would contain two panels to illustrate the tragedy with text and pictures. This would be placed along the Chicago River Walk where the disaster occurred, and it has a proposed name of, quote, at the river's edge. As of the recording of this episode, there are no updates as to whether or not this project will move forward. Thank you so much to the Ship Illustrator here on YouTube for suggesting the SS Eastland. Hopefully this video does the ship justice not only for you guys, but especially for the victims of the disaster and all of those involved. This was a truly interesting yet incredibly tragic story. Rest in peace to the 848 who perished. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us, and don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the story of the São José Paquete Africa, a slave ship that sank off the coast of Cape Town in 1794. Have a great week and a safe New Year weekend. Happy New Year, and we'll see you next time.